with the uh, with Mr. Ellis, who was a uh, a clan wizard, if I remember correctly, and they yes, formed this friendship based on these things that they saw that were issues to both communities. I quoted but you know what I friendship. you know what I what I what I experienced with that was I experienced pain, and I mm-hmm. saw other people applauding. So it, it's it's different um, when you lived that. Mm. I lived that experience, and when you see it as just a story, yeah, it's totally it's totally different. So, so, so yeah, in your case, it hard... actually brought back some of the memories of what you went, what you remember. Going through whereas yeah, other people were seeing it through, in a more. Yeah, uh, I went through the water hose being turned on me and you yeah. know marching down the street. It's, it's so, so right. I I've been there. I know it. You know, it's like I I can smell it when it comes anywhere near me. <laughs> so I know that kind of mean racist attitudes, and yeah. I I I just my my spirit just know it can feel it. So so I'm either trying to disrupt it or run away from it. Yeah. It's interesting. It's hard in educational theater to think about, right? So do you want to do shows that right that that talk about history, right? And have roles for um uh young men and women of color but don't re traumatize. I remember seeing uh uh, Mike's piece that he did at Playmakers, and one of the things that I found remarkable about it, and I was so happy, is that they really made the violence um, about uh, the people who were perpetrating it, like the people who were being assaulted, the the black actors who are being killed, stood still, and you only saw in slow motion the white perpetrators, and that mm. flip of like this violence is not about the black bodies and you experiencing, again, black bodies having violence on them. This is about you having to look at people who look like you that ugly. And I thought it was a really um, uh, instructive for me as an educator, right, that, um, uh, that maybe the more powerful thing to do is not to do Harriet Jacobs, right, on stage for young actors, but instead to, like we said with Sound of Music, you know, we had an Asian student, we had an African-American student, and I was like, if you can't figure out that they're brothers and sisters, the 9,000 times Sound of Music points out that they're a family, then I don't want you in my audience. If you're like, wait, it's an Asian kid and a black kid, I don't understand, how are they family? Like, go away, don't come to the theater. <laughs> like, I literally think that about anybody, but like, no, I, 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 you're not the kind of audience that I want to direct to. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe that that's this, the way to go. Yeah, because there's been whole conversations just where we're seeing people getting upset over certain folks playing what they consider to be a role that was originally um, a role of a European-American. I'm thinking about, like, what this whole conversation is with Beyonce and the role that she's playing now. Well, that's also about the business, Mark. Like, that's about the business. That's, that's about if, if there are only, you know, three roles for white women, then go find a white woman. Because at that certain level, at the level of those business, like, those are business opportunities that don't come people's way. Right? Where Beyonce is going to get tons of, well, not Beyonce, but does that make sense? Yeah. Like, particularly white men. Right, like Charlene's, uh, Char- Charlize Theron doesn't need to play everything. <laughs> she doesn't. I mean, once you get to that level, it's really about, like, uh, for me, um, it, it, it's the Deepak thing, right? Like that this is a market that can only hold so much. Mm-hmm. And when the big giants are taking it, but there's no room for the little guys. Because if you're an unknown Asian woman, you're the little guy in the market. And mm-hmm. so if there's one thing that says, hey, we need an Asian woman, maybe you should go look for Asian women. 
Now, I think it gets more complex at the community level, community theater level, and at the high school level. Because oh, yeah. if you don't have those kids, then how do you tell the stories? Then it gets to be this, like, circular thing that I can't do ragtime hairspray. We're doing hairspray this year. And my white students are like, oh, do you think we have enough actors? I'm like, I don't know, but we're going to find out. I'm tired of not doing the show because we're afraid we don't have it. We were afraid we didn't have the Latinx men. We found them. You know, I think you're getting that loop. Yeah, definitely. But one of the things that I know you've been very much involved in the struggle with is how are we able to maintain the community theater? Because you just mentioned the DPAC, and, of course, there's the big shows that we get all the time. But our community theaters are oftentimes struggling. I'm not sure. I don't think Common Ground is still around. I know um, Man Bites no. went under. There's always talk. No, Even Man Bites go under. The they were tired. Those down. boys did their work, and they wanted to go be in love. And I go and go with God. <laughs> Um, I think well. I, th- I think that what you well, since I, Commissioner Howerton is here, I don't think I, I don't think you can put the the horse back in the barn. But when you open a large venue like CPAC, what you what you can do is put pressure to say that those people need to give back to the community, right? There that it's that there are rehearsal halls that are free for a community theater underneath that. Right, mm-hmm. that there are that there are spaces, and that they make more than this much money in a year. If their profit margin goes up, you know, when you fund those things with city money, you can lay out some regulations that once they get big enough, they've got to start to build a ladder up. Right, that that they have to have a grant program for emerging mm-hmm. artists. You know, they have to run a summer training camp for young art like that you there are things that you can do um i think that those projects are so big sometimes that people don't think about the what their footprint is going to do to the local scene right afterwards and i think it's also hard because people like me i'm an educator i'm busy you know i'm making my own art i'm i'm <laughs> i i, I, I does that make sense like we're not in the room and nobody mm. needs to ask and, for us and to I, be and, in the room and and i tell you that's the Half of the battle is being at the table. Right. Having people at the table that can carry you carry the ideas. So everybody can't be at the decision making table, but somebody needs to be there and, and communicating that information back to the community. Because I I totally believe that. Somebody has to let the community know what's going on. Yeah, and, and you're right. It has to be that kind of community voice, and the, the community needs to have that voice. And that's across the board, whether it's something like the DPAC, and I agree that there are ways that they can be involved in the community level. But even sometimes our festival scene, I know a lot of people were very much concerned, and we had him on the show recently, when Suleiman bought the Art of the Cool, that it was going to become more like this corporate kind of festival, but I do know that he's having conversations with people to make sure that there is a element of what is our local mu- music community involved in it. It's right. not just him bringing down the acts that are the big national or international right. acts, but that there are other parts of it involved that play into what our local community is. Right. I think that that's something that has to happen on a regular basis, whether that's the big festivals, whether that's the big venues or things of that nature, but uh, or even supporting the local ones. Like I said, you know, right. I work at the and I I'm also on the board of the Carolina Theater. Right. And I can't speak to the internal workings of it. I only know that as a Durhamite from the outside, Durham mm-hmm. Central Park and its model, how it was, how it's come along and how engaged it stays in the community and how local those things, Durham Central Park to me seems to be a model that is taking from but also giving back. Now, obviously that's because it's a not-for-profit, but – that kind of idea, like this is something that um, uh, they definitely had input. They definitely left spaces for people to find a way in. So has, right? so has anybody had any conversation with D, uh, around with DPAC in this conversation? No, I don't know if they're physically set up for that. Right, but I, I I know that that was a model when they started the place in Raleigh. There were definitely 
two or three theaters underneath that they were renting to local theater companies for a, um, a less than nominal fee. But, you know, who knows? Those are money makers. I know the Art Center in, in Chapel Hill also has had their ups and downs of being super open to the community and then being in financial difficulty and then tightening back up and then losing people who couldn't afford to use their spaces, right? But they've been up and down and up and down. I know that they've been very generous to the one company that has survived and, you know, um, goes around. It's a high school company, um, One Song Productions. I only know what are the good spaces that are economical to rent because that's where they find the place to be. So wherever One Song is, it's usually the amenable open space in the triad. Hmm. You know that, Mark. They're right down the... They're right down the, the, the hallway from you. Yeah, they're around the, around the corner from me doing the, uh, when I'm doing the radio show and everything in uh, WCOM. So yeah, they've done a lot of great work with the children and everything. How did you get involved with that? Because when you told me about their, now they had gotten that space, I was just amazed that it was actually run by the children. So I don't even think, I know you adults consult them, but am I not correct in thinking that they actually run that theater company almost? No, the they, they don't that consult with adults. <laughs> there are many students who I've trained that are part of it, and I, can, I, I offer my consult whether they want it or not <laughs> as um, uh, students of mine. But, no, they are a completely student-run organization, which I also think is fantastic. <clears throat> they get it's opportunities to see those. do things. Well, <clears throat> the way Durham is growing, I don't think there's anything that cannot be done. Right. It just takes the will and the dollars. Oh yeah, totally. Isn't I think that I was always telling the way? You... <laughs> <laughs> it's always totally. the way. And like I was telling Dee before I brought y'all on to the conversation, and everything. I was just amazed this weekend because you know, some third Fridays I'm busy at Hate that, so I don't always get to do the third Friday walk. But I and I didn't do that much of it, but I did go to the Truth and Power exhibit at uh, Pleiades and went by the Art Guild and actually ran into a young brother that started his own studio called Rip Town right there on Main Street. And apparently he's got his rent for what is relatively affordable for downtown. I think he told me he's paying like 25 or 26 a month. So that for downtown is actually not that bad. <laughs> and so he was doing that and making that available not just to his space as a professional and uh, artistic photographer, but also to others. Because I know Kevin Seifert and who I think you know Hope, and others were I in do. there, and, and he had some musicians who were in there. So Kevin's work was up there. And then apparently once a month, maybe it's more than that, they're having, like, these community meetings well, among the art community. So they're forming, like, an art collective in that space downtown. But just being there in the downtown area, and like you said, uh, Commissioner Howard, just seeing that diversity, because, I mean, there was all kinds of stuff going on. I want to say this was yeah. the weekend of uh, the N.A. convention, so uh, Narcotics Anonymous, and I don't know if it was their statewide or I'm thinking it was their statewide conference based on the amount of people I saw. But they were in the Marriott. There were people busting around it unscripted up in the pool that they've got up there and having, like, some reggae playing. Um, there was just people just of all classes, races, um, orientations and everything just kind of, like, in downtown Durham. And it was just bustling on that Friday night. Hmm. So I think one of the things that we don't talk about, um, uh, the value of the arts, is there's sort of an immune system for a community, right? That having a robust arts community helps you move through change in a healthier way than you would have without it. And I think that when we talk about, like for me, again, thinking about arts as a commodification of of, of of the job is not where I find the value in the arts, And I don't think you can make that argument. I really don't. Um, I think you can make the argument that, that being an artist is part of your civic duty, that finding some way to contribute artistically inside of your community is just as important as voting, is just as mm -hmm. important as mm -hmm. mowing your lawn. But they are the mm -hmm. maintenance of a civic society. It's the brushing the teeth of your community. 
and you need it. 